Hi, hello everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I realized that uh, they put me right after lunch and they gave you all pullback chairs. So uh, try to not fall asleep if you can. So we'll be talking about new risks uh, in serverless security. Um, a bit about me. So uh, I've been uh, managing teams and groups of uh, developers and developing a large scale cloud-based applications for the past um, decade or so. Part of uh, CloudLock that was acquired by Cisco. I was uh, headed the development of uh, Cisco Cloud Security in Israel. Um, I founded with uh, two partners uh, Cl at Cloud Essence um, and that was acquired by Contrast. And today I'm uh, heading the development of uh, Contrast Security's uh, serverless offering. Okay, so why is this even interesting? Um, so IDC predicts that by uh, 2021, by uh, this year, 70% of newly developed applications will be developed as cloud native applications, meaning applications that uh, use hyper agile technologies, microservices, um, containers, and serverless. So serverless is part of cloud native, it's not just cloud native. Um, so the shift has already begun um, cloud native transformation is happening. A lot of um, big companies that we know, like uh, iRobot Roomba, um, uh, Skyscanner, and others, have already moved, and most of their uh, existing applications are already developed as cloud native applications. And other big companies are moving and shifting more and more applications. Uh, we believe that that will be the prominent and most dominant development um, architecture within the, the next couple of years, and most analysts support our belief. Um, when we see cloud native, we see it much more than just an architecture. So yes, obviously it's an architecture change, right? Instead of a monolith, a big application, um, there are a lot more smaller components. We're trying to unlock the potential of the cloud. We're using the services that the cloud provide. We're using small, really small components, creating pipelines and, and trying to make them as efficient as possible. But other than that, it's also about how we develop, right? So smaller cycles, right? In the past, we had long versions um, older teams probably once in a couple of months, newer agile scrum teams would have delivered at the end of their cycle, right? At the end of the sprint. Today, um, a lot of teams that are working in cloud native, including my teams, they push code to production a couple of times a day on a regular basis. So it's much more frequent and it has to be part of your process. It has to be in line, right? And that's the second thing, processes. In the past, a lot more manual processes that would have been sort of um, maintained or demanded. Today, we try to automate everything. If it's not part of my automation, part of my flow, it won't really work, right? It's going to slow me down. Everything needs to be part of, the, part of our automated processes. And the last thing is decision. Right? We're creating teams that are supposed to be small, efficient, multifunctional, DevSecOps. They own what they develop end to end. And that's what we're expecting them to do. And part of that is also giving them the responsibility. There are small startups within big organizations, but we're giving them, um, we're asking them to own everything and also giving them a responsibility. So a lot of time they can choose the technology, they can choose the tools, they make the decisions. Right, so the decision making is coming bottom up um, instead of top down. Um, so now let's focus a bit about serverless. So serverless is basically a very big puzzle. It's a lot of a lot of small components talking with each other through through some kind of a buffer, through some kind of glue. Um, it could be uh, queues, it could be API calls, it could be events that that trigger the whole system. Um, and when you have this kind of enormous amount of resources, it's hard to, how do you secure them? Each one has its own policy. Each one has um, different kind of restraints. Um, and setting some kind of, you can use group policies in some cases, but a lot of times you need to be very precise in what you want to put on each one of those different resources. And in order to do that, you need to actually understand what you want to do and what's going on within the platform. So let's talk a bit about serverless. Um, so I'll talk most, mostly around AWS serverless. So 
when a serverless, uh, when, when we deploy serverless, what happens behind the scene is basically there's a container, and that container spins up when it's requested, when when an event has triggered, and all the uh, and most of the the architecture is based on event driven. So an event happened, and that event could could come from um, the end of a processing of an EMR. It could have it could come from an S3 bucket uh, that we uploaded a file or a Dynamo DB stream or whatever. Um, and it runs, and when it finishes, it basically gets disposed. The environment itself is a read-only, and that's, that's obviously an advantage from a security perspective, but you still have access to uh, the slash temp. There's no direct um, internet access, so while the container is up, you can't, unless you, you do a lot of stuff, uh, can't directly call it. It doesn't have an endpoint that you can actually access. So. It also that's also a, um, a pro, and the data is temporary. Most of serverless is a stateless architecture. It runs when it's disposable. The data is disposed with it. The code is part of the environment, um, and keys are available as part of environment variables. So what gives the container, uh, the serverless function, the ability to actually perform the um, the activities that it's supposed to perform is based on these environment variables that are set within the function that give it its privileges and permissions to do what it's supposed to do. But what about security? So if we look at Google Trends uh, in the last couple of years, we see that the trend is rising. More and more people are searching for serverless computing, serverless in general. But when we look at the trend for serverless security, it's basically a flat line, right? Nothing has really changed. And that's very common. Security tools usually lag behind technology a couple of years. Um, we've heard it in, in a, another talk here before. Um, but we all, I think, agree that we want to have the same kind of security visibility um, on our new technologies like we've already been used to in the past on other technologies. So the question is, can we use traditional AppSec tools to be applied on serverless. And let's first understand a bit um, the risk, the different risks, and the thing that we want to do in a serverless uh, security um, component. So this is an example uh, of a function, a Lambda function uh, in Python. Um, and what we see that this, this function actually does, it's very simple, right? It, it uh, accepts an event. From the event, it, it gets a couple of uh, attributes, and then it takes those attributes and um, saves them into a DynamoDB. DynamoDB, if you're not familiar, it's a, it's a database as a key value, database as a service that AWS provides. Uh, it's very common to be used in, in serverless architectures and cloud-native architectures. So overall, very simple. Um, and when we deploy this function, we have to right, also give it a permission, a policy, a role, and within that role, a policy to, uh, to enable what it can actually do within the cloud. Okay? So what happens uh, in AWS, for example, you have a couple of thousands methods, something like 8,000, and you have something like 5,000 different uh, permissions that you need to assign. And obviously, that's very hard sometimes to understand what is the right permission to the right action. And as developers, and I've seen this with my developers a lot, what we first of all do is we go out and search for it, right? Then we get a, uh, an answer back from Stack Overflow. And sometimes it's a good answer, but sometimes it's something that's a bit over permissive. And what a developer will, will sometimes do is basically, because he's not sure about what's the, the exact permission, will use an asterisk. And basically what this says is that for this specific function, you can do all the actions on a DynamoDB, everything, create a table, delete a table, get the data, list the data, query, scan it, everything that that table can, uh, th that's available on the table. The another thing we need to set is the boundaries of those permissions. So that's the resource. Who am I actually able to, to um, do th those activities on, right? Um, in this case, we've set the permissions 
on all the tables within that account within that region. So maybe this is, is running on an orders table, but if I have a user table and from some reason an attacker has compromised that function, he will be able to actually access all my tables and basically have, have um, access to all my data within that, uh, within that region. Um, so what do we want to do? Okay, so th we want to limit the scope of the function, the permissions, to only what it actually needs to do. And by doing that, we're really minimizing the risk. So even if for some reason an attacker has succeeded in compromising, and, and I'll show you even a demo about that later, um, uh, succeeded of uh, compromising this function, all he'll actually be able to do is put item, and in this case it's very easy to see like the permission, um, is very similar to the actual method that's being called. You'll only be able to add more items into that table, and by limiting also um, to the specific table, he'll only be able to do it on my orders table. So I'm really, really minimizing the risk that even if something happens, um, it will be, it, it will, will cause a, a lot of uh, issues in my system. Another thing that's uh, different in, uh, in serverless architectures is the loss of perimeter. Um, so if we're used to, um, uh, in other architectures, to sort of have all our microservices or monolith behind a DMZ, behind a protected zone, um, in a serverless architecture, that's, um, there's no, no real perimeter. So if in the past I could have uh, put an API gateway and put all my policies in that API gateway and everything is behind that, or a Bastion or a VPN, and basically apply all my policies on that specific entry point, in a serverless architecture, um, if, um, functions get triggered based on events. And those events could come from, as we said, an S3 bucket. It could come from an Alexa. Um, my colleague has a demo that he shows how he um, triggers an Alexa um, device and by that actually um, has a, triggers an SQL injection into a function, right? There's no um, single perimeter that you can lock that will make your whole application safe. So when we talk about serverless risks, um, there's, there are a couple. First one is event injection, similarly to what we've talked, getting um, all kinds of parameters and not using them correctly within your code. Broken authentication, what we just discussed, is not having the ability to only limit on a s specific policy and by that you may lose, um, you may lose the, um, the authentication um, measures on specific uh, function or specific events coming into the system. Um, sensitive data exposure, we've seen that a lot. It's very common, misconfigurations that may, lose, may lead to um, data exposure or based on broken authentication. Um, Overprivileged function, that's exactly what we discussed, right? A lot of times, and we've seen this uh, with a lot of companies, we give the functions much more privileges than they actually need because it's, it's a tough problem to solve. Um, vulnerable dependencies, that's similar to every other architecture, basically, um, you add uh, additional uh, um, libraries into your code, into your system, and they bring with them additional vulnerabilities. Uh, insufficient logging and monitoring. So um, in, in network-based architectures, when we have the full ab ability to, you know, to monitor from a network and from a process p perspective, um, our services in a serverless architecture, it's a bit different. Um, you have monitoring and logging built in, but they're pushed into specific services that you need to overall make sure that you have the visibility and you need to actually add a lot of, of processes and code around that in order to, to give you the same kind of uh, visibility that you were used to. Um, open resources, similar to sensitive data, open resources that lead to sensitive data, denial of service and denial of attack. So uh, one of the pros of serverless architecture is pay as you use, right? but uh, they're also very highly scalable. And it means that an attacker, if you have a, a, um, an uh, API-based um, Lambda that you've left open um, and that runs for a couple of seconds, an attacker can very easily 
basically uh, create a script that will just trigger it again and again and again. And if you do not put the right concurrency limit on top of that, um, it will run indefinitely and it will scale up and scale up and scale up. And eventually you will see the cost in your uh, payment by the end of the month. So denial of wallet is also a common risk. Um, insecure secret management, um, also where do I keep my secrets? A lot of time uh, we use environment variables in serverless architectures. There are ways to do that better, but that's another risk. Um, there's the OWASP serverless uh, top 10. It's basically an interpretation to the OWASP top 10. Um, it's an open project. Um, we're, uh, we're leading it. Um, if you want to contribute, if you want to add, and uh, please feel free um, to, to um, reach out to us. Um, okay, so let's do a short demo. Um, what we're going to see here is an attacker that's actually going to um, um, get the um, access token of a specific Lambda and what he can actually do with it. In this case, the attacker is going to um, use a command injection in order to, um, to expose those uh, environment variables. Um, he's doing that by uploading a file to an S3 bucket. That S3 bucket triggers a Lambda. Just to be clear, the S3 bucket isn't exposed. It's fully secure. Everything is fully configured. The problem is um, a code injection within the Lambda itself. Okay. Okay. So um, we're using here a, an application called DVSA. I'll, I'll show it a bit later. Basically, it's an e-store um, for um, games, online e-store for games. And that, uh, that e-store has a feedback form, right? And as a user, I can go into that feedback form, add my feedback, send it up, and everything works. It also has the ability to attach a file. Um, and if we look at what happens when we attach a file, uh, there's a request sent to the backend. The backend right, receives the, the file and then sends back a signed re response. A signed response is basically giving the client the ability to upload a file into an S3 in a secure way. Okay? Um, so the attacker can easily see this, that this is uh, uh, what the application is doing. And basically based on that, what we're going to do right after we send a file, um, we're going to change the file name in order to add our command injection. Um, so let's change the file name and we'll add basically a curl request to a, to a server that we have um, available. And basically we're going to um, get all the environment variables, base64 them and send them in the curl request to our um, available server. So attaching the file, sending it. Okay, and we got the request back. Um, so we have an ngrok server here. Basically we're taking what we, the, the payload that we just got. Let's say base64 decode it back and let's see what we got. So here we have all the environment variables within the, the Lambda. And when we look at what's in that Lambda, like we mentioned uh, earlier, basically it has all the access token, access key, ac access secret that give that Lambda the ability, the permissions to act and, and do all the calls within AWS. Now, if I add that, those um, specific permissions into my credentials file in AWS, basically, I'm going to use them from my laptop, right, directly to the cloud. I don't need to be in a Lambda, right? I don't need to be in that microservice in order to exploit it. Once I have those um, keys, I can use them from everywhere, anywhere, uh, and, and basically use them in order to um, do whatever they allow me. And in this case, we're going to exploit an S3 bucket because this Lambda has overprivileged uh, permissions. So basically, 
I can yeah, just use that and list all the buckets within the environment. And now go deeper and deeper, start listing all the files within those buckets. And again, it's all because I'm actually using the permissions of that Lambda. It's not because those buckets are misconfigured or anything like that. It's just because that Lambda has been given overprivileged um, permissions. And basically, if we go deeper and deeper, um, we can actually get one of the orders, we can change an order, basically do whatever this function is, is able to do. Right, so here we got an order, we can change that order, push it back, and do all kinds of stuff. Okay, another thing, risk in the environment is scale, right? So we said we've moved from a monolith, we've moved to, um, to microservices, and now we're moving to functions as a service, um, very small functions, nano services, as some people call it, and there are a lot of services. There are much more frequent deployments, right? It's happening much faster. Um, it's hard to understand who's talking to who, right? A lot of services. Um, there are a lot of developers, few app secs, and it's hard to understand where should I start, what's the priority, what should I actually secure. Um, when we look at traditional app sec testing, the, um, the problems in traditional app sec testing is basically, first of all, um, it's ignorant to the context. In serverless application, the infrastructure or the services that you use with your actual code is the application itself. There's not a real big distinction between the two. You can't run your code without the underlying, uh, architect the, the underlying infrastructure that's connecting everything, every piece to the one to the other. So without understanding the context, without understanding the big picture, I'll probably give a lot of false positives and won't be able to actually detect the right security uh, that needs to be applied. It's completely uh, blind to edge devices. Okay, so if we look, and we'll talk about that, dust devices, they need a URL. In an Alexa case, there's no URL. In an S3 case, there's no URL, so they don't have an access point. They can't actually work on it. Um, it's blocking developers, traditional AppSec, blocks developer, and it's hard to scale. If we look at a traditional uh, sort of pipeline, right, so the first thing, uh, I have Mario, he's a developer, Right, and Luigi, he's an AppSec. So the first thing I want to do is I'll add a SAS tool, right? Static analysis on top of my, um, my source code repository. What happens, as we said, first of all, there are a lot of applications, right? Each one of those small components is an application by itself. A stats tool does not have the wider context, does not understand the interactions be between them because he's actually looking, right, at the code itself without the connection between them. So what will happen is there are going to be a lot of false positives. The AppSec will need to put a lot of work in it in order to filter those, configure, etc. Next thing I can do is add an IaaS tool. <laughs> I went the other way around. Um, so add an IaaS tool that's much more accurate, right? It runs on, on top of my uh, actual payload. It's in the environment, but in a serverless architecture, I don't have a server to actually instrument. Much harder to do. Um, and can also impact my performance. Um, so I'll try a dust tool. But in a dust tool, we just said there's problems about what's the entry point, what happens after I uh, actually um, uh, invoke that entry point. So again, there's problems with the existing um, traditional uh, AppSec tools. So let's see how do we, we secure a serverless application. This is a iRobot serverless app. Okay, um, and in this case, w what's happening, this is taken from AWS, it's uh, publicly available. Um, so what's happening here is there's a, an API call that the iRobot is actually doing. That API call triggers a Lambda. That Lambda puts something on the queue. That queue actually can put uh, the message on a DLQ in case it fails. Um, there's a Lambda that's actually uh, processing events from that queue and then it sends it to another Lambda. 
that Lambda creates an IoT role and creates another IoT policy. Basically, a lot of things are happening here behind the scene. And everything is talking to Cloud Watch logs. So if I, I try to use the traditional tools, right, I'll add SCA, SCA great, uh, software composition analysis, analysis, right? I'll try and uh, find all the vulnerabilities in my dependencies. Um, and that's awesome, right? We, we all use it today. I think there are a lot of uh, available tools in all the different stages within the pipeline, but it covers only uh, a specific amount of percentage of, of the actual application. It doesn't cover your actual code, right? Um, so it's basically just fixing things that you've imported, and we know that it's uh, highly available today. So what about using infrastructure as code? So obviously, when you're using a serverless infrastructure as code, something that you're probably using, and there are a lot of frameworks in, in cloud native in general, but infrastructure and code and, and scanning infrastructure and code doesn't really scan anything within your internal code, like the uh, code injection that we've actually seen. So it looks more for misconfiguration, and that's good. And um, it's shift left in that sense. That's awesome. But it doesn't really secure your environment with all the different layers that you are actually need to secure. Um, so we talked about IaaS, a really modern uh, application security tool, right? But basically, it has a limitation in serverless about how do you actually instrument and uh, about coverage. So I just need specific coverage in order to actually um, inspect and find all the different vulnerabilities within your code. SAST, um, a lot of applications. SAST basically looks for a sync source, right? Uh, analysis, taint analysis. Um, there's no immediate sync, no real source, um, and there's no real context. So creates a lot of false positives. Um, and hard to actually tune. Dust, right? No HTTP request. It's event-based. From this iRobot uh, API call, I get back a 200 response. But most of the application happens asynchronously behind the scene. A Dust tool will never see that, right? So being outside of the, the uh, environment uh, gives it a lot of a blind spot. So what do we do? Um, so these are, is, this is our approach. Basically, one tool to rule them all. Um, and what we're working on is developing a continuous, frictionless, and complete solution that uses all the existing mythologies, but uses them in a cloud-oriented way, in a serverless-oriented way, in order to identify, find the root cause, be part of your pipeline, um, and, and basically, uh, identify the problems that we've uh, just mentioned. So basically what we do is we seamlessly connect. We're using the same cloud um, abilities that exist today in order to uh, immediately connect. There's no real configuration. Everything happens out of the box. And we discover, because we have the ability to do that within the infrastructure as code, right? Within the infrastructure, discover all the different resources that you have in your environment, immediately analyze, uh, we simulate, right, because we understand the context, we understand the application, we simulate different attacks, we analyze and then we simulate those attacks, we verify that those attacks really happened, right, and after that we report, integrate, and the last part is we continuously monitor. So we're part of the environment, whenever something new happened, whenever there's a change, we immediately detect it, we understand what's the diff, what has just changed, and we only scan those specific areas that have changed. Um, so this is an example. Again, Mario just pushed a new API. Um, that API calls a function, that calls an S3 bucket, that calls another function. Um, and in this case, what will happen is we'll immediately identify that a new API has been deployed. Um, we'll identify the flow within that new API. Um, and based on that, Right, will uh, basically scan and simulate and attack all e each one of those uh, specific components separately and understand where is the actual um, where is the actual vulnerability and detect that. Um, similarly, you can you can do the same thing 
right? Uh, another flow through Alexa, create an Alexa, um, deploy that, will identify automatically, and then um, find when the, where the vulnerability is. is. Okay. Um, so, uh, DVSA. Uh, DVSA is a dumb, damn vulnerable uh, serverless application that you can use. Um, it's part of an OWASP uh, project that we help to maintain. Um, you can deploy it. There are about 30 different uh, vulnerabilities within it that you can use uh, and, and learn. Do not use it in production, okay? It's vulnerable by design, so do not deploy it to any, any account that has any um, thing that uh, you need to, to be secure. Um, but it's a great project to, to learn better around um, serverless and serverless vulnerabilities in, uh, in general. Um, this is a bit more um, about our product. Um, we call it CAST. Uh, it's cloud uh, application security testing. And uh, basically what we provide is a, a, a over uh, privileged uh, functions. We detect them, list privilege, and uh, making sure that uh, you secure your, uh, your li you limit your ra uh, blast radius. Um, OS command injections, so we detect uh, all kind of uh, the serverless top 10 command injections um, and also provide OSS. Um, and we're part of a uh, contrast, right? Uh, contrast has a lot more um, of, uh, of tools within its platform um, to support both uh, development, testing, and uh, prod, both the uh, SAS scanner today, uh, an IaaS tool to um, secure your testing, and also a, a tool to secure your production uh, workloads. And there's also contrast OSS to the, the detect the specific um, dependencies. And now we're adding, basically, uh, it will be launched in, in, the, in the next coming uh, weeks, a uh, contrast for serverless. That's it. Um, last thing is if you do want to learn more and, and by any chance you're uh, participating in re-event, in re-event will be uh, launching a, a jam session, basically that you can uh, uh, log in, use, you, you, it creates automatically serverless uh, workload for you that you can actually test and learn. Um, and, and understand better what are the serverless risks and how do you actually approach them and secure them. Well, thank yeah. you so much.